Hello again, I'm back with the horror novel reviews now and I'm also back at the table because it's just easier to do it this way with the novel reviews because this way I can uh, show off the cover art such as it is and the uh, synopsis and also any times I might want to show some example passages in the book. It's easier to do it this way rather than facing the camera so uh, that's why I'm back to this format for now. And uh, this is a review of James Herbert's 1994 novel The Ghost of Sleeth but it's not going to be a series of James Herbert books because um, that's just too much to take on when you devote so much time just to one writer. For organizational purposes, I will label these videos as like, you know, review number one, review number two, and so on, so that I can put them into playlists. But what I'm going to be doing now is sometimes I'll do a James Herbert novel review, then I'll do like a Ramsey Campbell or a, even a Stephen King sometimes. So... To kick things off then, after I finished my Richard Lehman survey, I was in the mood for something a bit more atmospheric and evocative, so I turned to the trusty James Herbert and one of his ghost stories. So, uh, Ghost of Sleeth, and as I always used to do with the Lehman reviews, let me start by showing off the cover art, by way of having a little rant about how the, the changes in how major publishers have been marketing their big name horror writers over much of the last 20 years. I mean, look at this. It's yeah, it's elegant and it's all very nicely designed and stuff like that. But what exactly is it meant to be? It's just some kind of staircase. But uh, let me just give a comparison here with some some books. I mean, the 80s and the 90s was a great, great time to be into horror fiction because you got stuff like uh, Steve Crisp's great work on Richard Lehman's books. You had the uh, legendary Paul Davis with his Stephen King covers over here. Uh, Simon Dewey, who was also at Hot a Headline, he was doing Ramsey Campbell's stuff. You know, I mean, uh, New English Library had this kind of thing going on for Stephen Laws. And then you've got uh, Pan Warner, who did the, the Graham Masterton stuff. I mean, these are just great, great cover arts and really set the scene and evoke what you're about to read whereas um this not so much this is like uh it's published by the way by harper collins it's like they're ashamed to be published in horror so they had to try and present it as more elegant than what it actually is so yeah the cover art there it is nothing to say about it it doesn't even say who the artist is it's just some firm that they've got to do it all right, here's the synopsis anyway. It says, can a ghost haunt a ghost? Can the dead reach out and touch the living? Can ancient evil be made manifest? These are the questions that confront psychic investigator David Ash when he delves into the mysterious events terrorizing the community of Sleeth, a small quaint village hidden away in the Chiltern Hills. In Sleeth, he will fear for his own sanity as each dark secret is unveiled and terrible malign forces are unleashed. For the full horror will be beyond imagination. Sleeth, where the dead will walk the streets. This is the second book in a trilogy that he wrote. The first one was Haunted, which is a fantastic book. Uh, this is the second one. And the third one was his last published novel before his death, simply called Ash, after the main character, David Ash. And, uh, right, okay, so let me uh, talk about the plot of this. It The plot turns out to be a pretty basic ghost story. We have a town where uh, a certain family, the Lockwoods, they've been practicing the dark arts for centuries, and this has involved their ritualistic torture and murder of children. The reason they've been doing that is a drawback of the novel, because it's it's really quite vague. It's something to do with wanting to control the souls of the ones they've murdered in order to gain information about the afterlife, and and thereby... Well, this is where things become very unclear, because somehow by doing that, they think they're going to gain immortality. I don't quite get how they thought immortality would follow from any of this child sacrifice that they've been doing, especially because for seven centuries of the Lockwoods doing this, it apparently hasn't yet happened for them. They're not immortal. So you'd think they would have reconsidered their methods by this point. That was a bit confusing as to why they're doing it. But in terms of what they're doing, they are just these kind of evil people who are uh, sacrificing, torturing, murdering, it seems sexually abusing children in order to gain control of their souls after they die. Fast forward to the present day, and for whatever reason, all these ghosts of Sleeth, uh, in other words, the souls of all the people tortured and murdered throughout the years, they've woken up and they're now haunting the village. Like I said, it's pretty basic uh, ghost story. You've just got some kind of ancient evil, some ancient sin, which comes back for retribution. Uh, the good and bad, then. Let me start with the bad, because I enjoyed this book, and I want to end on the positives. 
as I just mentioned, the plot turns out to be quite unoriginal, and where it counts, it's just not explained well enough. It's it's hinted at that many of the most prominent citizens of the village, not just the lords of the Manor Lockwood family, but many of the people in this village, they're in on this satanic child sacrificing club. But that's all it is, it's hinted at. Um, it's implied that the village doctor is part of it, but that was dropped as quickly as it was brought up, as it was with the pub landlord and a, a couple of other peripheral characters. There are too many questions in this book that are raised and not answered. For example, why they're doing this when it apparently isn't working? Why they're using those particular methods? I mean, child torture, other than to shock in a horror novel. Why now have these ghosts decided to wake up after seven centuries of all these debauched activities? And uh, for that matter, how the hell has all of this been escaping the notice of the authorities down the years? And really the most confusing thing for me, this novel seems to suggest that the, the evil that hovers over Sleeth, it's a bit like what happened in Stephen King's It. In other words, it infects ordinarily normal people and it has them doing evil things too. We have in this book uh, a father who is incredibly abusive to his son, ultimately killing him. We have another guy who goes berserk and scrapes a young man's face off. Uh, that's by far the most gruesome scene in the novel. If these ghosts are somehow possessing the village folk and, and turning them evil, why are they doing that? And and how? And again, why now? Why after all these centuries have they suddenly decided to start doing this to the town? Um, so that's that's really the, the negative of this. It's it's the story, the plot. It's it, it's a bit a bit undercooked and underdeveloped. Um, it feels like a bit of a mishmash of ghost story cliches which aren't tied together all that well. It's just not in order for this thing to be really be effective, you do have to have a sense of just how horrific this child sacrificing group is. And there has to be something riding on the conclusion of their experiments or whatever it is they're doing. You know, you have to actually fear it coming to pass, it coming to fruition. But here, because I've no, actually no idea what is meant to happen when they've done all this, there's nothing really to fear. So yeah, the plot, not great. But uh, the good, well, the good, firstly, the good is uh, the writing. This is a beautifully written book for the most part. There's a very fine line between uh, great descriptive writing and pompous overwriting. And here, Herbert just about gets the balance right. There are a couple of very purple passages towards the end. I found myself having to look words up quite a bit towards the end, which um, I like to think I've got a pretty broad vocabulary. So if, if I'm having to look up words pretty much on every page, it means that he's using very archaic terms, which he probably could have used more basic ones. But uh, that is just towards the end. For the most part, this is really well poetically written uh, story. Uh, he establishes the village of Sleeth very well. There's a map at the beginning of the book uh, in this, but it um, there. But it wasn't needed. For me, it was ne wasn't necessary because within a hundred pages, I was there in this village. I was in Sleeth. I was feeling its sunshine, smelling its grass, feeling the coldness of the church seeping in to the bones and so on. I mean, he, he really did. Herbert was excellent at this kind of thing, at building a very eerie English village. And as someone who is from England and from the the north of England, where we've got all we've got many, many of these tiny villages in like the, the Pennine Hills and what have you. This kind of thing really rings true with me. And, and uh, I appreciate his skill at drawing this type of village. So, yeah, the atmosphere is great. As I said, the no this novel is less about story and it's more about mood and a sense of eeriness and unease. It's it's cliched, but I actually don't mind cliché so much in this kind of thing because it's a ghost story. Ghost stories tend to follow a familiar pattern. That's why the most successful ones aren't necessarily the most imaginative, but the best ones are the ones that evoke the feeling of dread and Im impending horror. And I think that Herbert does it really well in this book, even if the payoff turns out to be a bit disappointing. The first two thirds of this book are great. Really, really love it. The last third is a bit uninspired, uninspired and um, to be honest, a little bit rushed. But uh, I personally really love novels like this that are set in small towns and they introduce us to all the town folk and the places of the village, you know, the school, the church, the pub, the village green. 
the various local characters and Herbert does a very good job of that here. Um, you've probably gathered by now that I'm a massive fan of the English ghost story in the tradition of M.R. James, uh, who, by the way, was the, mas the master of it. No one would ever perfect it better than him. Maybe Charles Dickens, but uh, <clears throat> Herbert was a modern day master of the English ghost story. This haunted the secret of Crickley Hall. Even Ash uh, has its moments. Um, so yeah, I'm not going to go on too much more about this one. So The Ghosts of Sleeth from 1994 is going to be my first review of James Herbert's novels. It is recommended, but probably not to people who value story above all else in a horror novel, because like I said, this probably didn't need to be 409 pages long if plot is what we're going by. He does spend an awful lot of time and a lot of chapters and a lot of words and long sentences um, building up scenery and sets, which may some people might not care for it all that much, might not be too bothered about it. They probably just want him to get on with it. And in fact, some of the reviews that I read on Amazon before doing this review, a lot of the one and two star reviews did say that they found it very boring, um, <clears throat> very slow. The pacing isn't all that great. And they those people feel that Herbert just spent way too much time overwriting it and uh, unnecessary description. OK, I take that on board. We all have our different tastes as readers, but that's what they didn't like is what I like about this novel. So that's going to do it. Ghost of Sleeth from 1994. Not sure what's going to come up next. I'm thinking maybe a Ramsey Campbell or a Bentley Little, but I don't know. I will see, and then I'll surprise you guys with it, hopefully, if you're going to watch it. Uh, it's Friday, so have a great weekend, and I'll talk to you all again soon. Take care of yourselves, and bye for now. Thank you for watching.